Hello, I'm Dr. Ahmed Abdiral, and this is the second part of the phonation unit. And we are going to speak about the mechanics of phonation. How do we produce vocal fold vibration, or we know it as voice. So, first, recall from your AMP that the vocal folds are positioned like a V on top of the trachea. It's inside of the larynx. The larynx sits on top of the trachea. And the entire airway is closed. You know, it, it has the vocal folds on top, just like a V. And then there are two cartilages. Each vocal fold is attached to one cartilage called the arytenoid. When these cartilages are swung to the midline by special the muscles of adduction, then the vocal folds will go into this position. Um, this is the adducted mode, and it should be even more than that, but it is taken, this image is taken when a person was speaking. So when you, the person is speaking, the ends here, the arytenoid cartilages, and when they swing, uh, are rotated to the midline, they come here, and they become fixated. And then the vocal folds now are at the midline here. This is a new midline, so that when you fixate the two arytenoids, then the air pressure beneath the vocal folds blows them apart and curves each one of them, sends each one of them away from the midline. And then we'll explain how the, the vocal folds come back again and keep going back and forth. And that resistance between uh, subglottic pressure and the force of elasticity of the vocal folds, that mutual resistance is what actually produces the um, vibration. So the vocal folds must be opened wide open uh, while you are breathing, because that is your airway. And if it is not closed, uh, I mean, if it is closed, then you cannot breathe. So, um, and the, they are similar to this at this position. This is a real vo real vocal folds, and at this position, that's the rest breathing. If you want to take deep breaths or run, and they, you have to consume, get more air in, you have to open them wider for exercise. So the vocal folds, um, also during sleep, they must be open, obviously. Your airway has to be opened all the time, except for a few times. So when you swallow, the vocal folds have to be completely sealed, adducted. You do not see a gap in between here. Uh, when you speak, uh, when you hold your breath, if you are diving underwater or uh, pushing or sneezing or coughing, these are situations that the vocal folds have to be adducted. Um, this is a video uh, that is going to show you stroboscopy, uh, a stroboscopy process, uh, video stroboscopy, where the vocal folds are imaged and even though they make, say, for a, for a female, a female, it makes about 225 hertz. And, uh, the, the, or for a male, about 115. The stroboscopy enables you to do it in slow motion. So you can image every single cycle as it goes back and forth. Slow motion, kind of. And the, the image, the, the, um, light from a strobe, strobe lights, you know, they are very bright and they make you um, visualize things very clearly. So there are two different kinds um, that the vocal folds adduct and abduct. The first one is, see this is, they are abducted now. All this happens with the arytenoids. So the arytenoids now are um, swung open. Um, and when the arytenoids are 
the, the muscles, uh, the intrinsic muscles of phonation contract, they swing the arenoids to the midline, they bring the vocal folds to the midline. So we call this arenoidal adduction. Because I want you to not to confuse adduction, abduction for vibration, you know, during speaking. When you speak, you, you cannot speak, you cannot make a sound unless you bring the vocal folds from this mode to this mode to have the arytenoids um, adducted, come together close, and then they, they bring the vocal folds to the midline. So this is the first step, the first kind of vocal fold adduction by the arytenoids. The second time the arytenoids are fixated and they don't do anything else, then the air is going to send the vocal fold into abduction and abduction based on the resistance of the uh, elasticity of the vocal fold and the air pressure. We'll explain this in a few minutes. So I'd like you to make the differentiation between the two. You cannot come to the condition that can help you speak, I mean vocalize, unless you go first to arytenoidal adduction. Okay, adduction by swinging the arytenoids to the midline and bringing the vocal folds. Then, the, once the arytenoids are swung into position and the vocal folds are tightly closed and compressed, then phonation, adduction, and abduction begins. So, um, in that case, when you now the vocal folds are fixated like this. Now, when they open, they are going to open more like this. So I'm going to show you. They're going to be opened like this. They will be put, each one will be pushed away from the midline. And then in that process, when it is pushed away, as the, the air starts to, to stream out, First, the bottom, so this is the edge of the vocal fold. The bottom of the edge of the vocal folds is going to be opened first. So they open from bottom to top. During the uh, phonation, adduction, and abduction. You need to visualize it. It is not too complex. So then, so it will be like this. They open from below. The, the, because the air pressure pushes itself, pushes the air through in between. So the bottom of the, of the edges of the vocal folds will open first and then continues to open until the air goes, starts to go out and then the bottom closes again first. So it clo opens from the bottom to the top and closes from bottom to the top. This only happens when you are speaking about phonation, adduction and abduction so here are the two described you really have to know the difference it is a tremendous difference and you are not going to find it really clearly detailed in any textbook that, that i'm aware of so the first thing in order to bring the vocal folds in position to vocalize you must switch them from from um, abduction, from the breathing mode into arytenoidal adduction, the speech mode, just like that. See the arytenoids are here, now fixated, now leave it for pressure and elasticity, they will do the rest to produce phonation cycles, and that's it. So the, the now, with the arytenoids fixated now, to the, the force, when you bring the vocal folds close together, subglottic pressure builds up. And when it builds up so much that it overcomes the edges. Recall that the edges, you know, for the vocal folds, that is called a mucosa, vocal fold mucosa. It is made up of the epithelial membrane, the top layer of the vocal fold, I mean the the cover, epithelial membrane. Yeah, the top layer that covers the vocal fold. When you go beneath it, 
you will find the first layer of the lamina propria and that these two together make the mucosa that is like gelatinous uh, like rubbery like this gummy toys that you see and and the the air is going to over air pressure will overcome these edges and they will push up away the vocal folds just like this here so then that now you have created now the vocal folds now when the air pressure decreases beneath because air escapes now the air pressure is going to decrease so the elasticity of the vocal fold will be stronger than the air pressure and then the vocal folds will swing back again to the midline as they swing back to the midline the pressure builds up and builds up until it becomes stronger than the elastic force of the vocal folds so that is the continuous you know seesaw effect that produces the cycle of vibration i cannot tell you how important that is and and the difference between these two and you need to really understand the structure because um, when you study voice the you know that is a whole class that is dedicated to to uh, to phonation and voice disorders so now <clears throat> we spoke about all the sounds uh, in uh, previously we said that all the speech sounds in english are 43 14 of them are vowels and the rest are consonants so all the vowels are described as periodic sounds periodic pure tone sounds now the consonants they are two groups one of them is completely aperiodic completely voiceless sounds and one group is a mix both periodic and aperiodic each sound we'll give you just a, a couple of examples so um, for example when you say the vocal folds have nothing to do with this sound except that yes the air escapes in between they are opened like this the air comes out but then the, lip, the lower lip contacts the makes a contact with the uh, uh, maxillary incisors and then we increase the pressure of the air we put more air expel more air out and then that narrow space is going to cause the friction so that is a voiceless sound most of the voiceless sounds the all of them except for two are made in the vocal tract so another example is th as in as in bath um, voiceless then you have s voiceless you have sh and you have voiceless all of these are voiceless sounds when you produce voiceless sounds the the vocal folds are widely abducted they are in breathing mode when you are producing um, voiced phonemes or voiced sounds the vocal folds are abducted and at the same time there is a constriction along the vocal tract somewhere so that that sound is a, a voice sound is a combination of voicing vibration by the vocal folds in addition to the noise that is caused by the obstruction along the um, vocal tract so in terms of whisper whisper is not healthy it's not a healthy behavior uh, someone whispers a lot that could dry the vocal folds and it can lead to stress here and it can cause a voice problem so this is the speech mode the two arytenoids are adducted the vocal folds are at the midline they are now like two elastics that you stretch and when you stretch the elastics like this if you take one away it's what it wants to go back again to the midline so 
the um, as a result, the, the each one of them will be displaced. You know, will be pushed far from the midline like this, and the other one like that. And but you notice that the 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 arytenoids are fixated. They do not have anything to do directly with the production of this kind of phonation cycle. All they, they do is to bring, to swing the vocal folds in position so that they can close the airway, can adduct and close the airway. Now whispering, the whisper mode, notice how here in normal phonation, the, the arytenoids have almost no gap in between. The, the space, by the way, that is normally found in between the arytenoids is called the uh, uh, cartilaginous glottis. So, because the, the, the two arytenoids are cartilages, and then, and this one is called the muscular glottis, the space, I mean. So, now, in whisper, the vocal folds um, uh, are kind of uh, come together, but not really so tightly like that. But the most important thing is that there is a triangle here in between. Like, see the arytenoids are swung in a strange way so that they can create a cut and the cartilaginous glottis is open. The air streams out of that and the person, um, you know, speaks in whisper, but there is no vibration between the vocal, uh, at the vocal folds. This is sometimes called the whisper triangle. And these are different modes to show you how breathing, aspirating your voice, uh, breathing or relaxed position and exercise or deep breathing. So here it is. You notice that this part of the muscle of the vocal fold itself, that's called the muscular glottis, the space. You notice a little space here. Uh, so that the vocal folds are not completely, you know, adducted. And more importantly, here's one cartilage, here's one, one arytenoid, one arytenoid. And you see the triangle in between. A lot of air escapes out of that as well. And that is called the cartilaginous glottis. And that is whisper mode. Again, it is not a, a healthy behavior. And if you do it as a, as a, as a habit, because hot air, as it goes, leaves the vocal folds, it will dry them at the same time. The, there's a lot of stress that is created here as a result, and that over time can make a, that habit can make a problem, cause a problem. So now when we see the basic formation process as, as a whole, first, you have to switch the first step. You will not be able to phonate. You will not be able to produce a sound unless you switch the vocal folds from breathing mode into arytenoidal adduction, just like that. Like that, arytenoidal adduction. So that is the first step. Then we, once they are brought to the midline, if we bring the vocal folds to the midline and they are fixated, um, then the pressure beneath them is going to build up and it will overpower the muscular, I mean, the muscular, the, what we call it, we call it the glottal edges of the vocal folds, the edges, the mucosa. And then that is, you know, the air pressure is going to push the each side of the vocal cord away like that. And then the air streams out. So as, as the vocal fold is displaced, as it travels away from the midline, it will, um, let me show you the cycle first. So as it swing, you know, away from the midline gradually, uh, the elastic force of the vocal folds, recall elasticity is the force that, that brings back a shape, uh, something that is, um, that is distorted or deformed out of shape, and it will bring it back to regain its shape or its position. 
So that elastic when it is pulled, I mean, I mean the vocal fold when it is displaced away from the vocal fold, the farther it goes away from its rest, the more resistance, the greater the elastic force of the vocal fold that will be that wants to bring it back to that midline again. So when it reaches the maximum limit of displacement on either side, I mean, the vo each vocal fold will. Elasticity of the vocal fold tissue is at maximum level. You do not have to measure it, but just know that at the maximum point of displacement, the vocal fold elasticity reaches the highest level, period. Now, what happens to pressure? The, the greatest point of displacement means that a lot of air is going to get out. The, the largest amount of air is going to exit the vocal folds at the maximum point of displacement because the door is swung wide open. But then that is going to cause the pressure now, the, the, the pressure beneath the vocal folds, subglottic pressure, is going to decrease. So because it decreases now, the elastic force, which is at the highest level, is going to start to swing the vocal fold back to the midline, each one. So, as the vocal fold begins to, to move to the midline, the pressure incrementally is going to build up, build up, because you are starting to close the door, and the line of people in, behind the door now are going to be just one person exiting at a time, and you have a whole group of people pushing and trying to get out. So this is, as soon as the uh, uh, glottal edges of the vocal folds that vibrate, as soon as they start to, to go back to the midline because of the elastic force, then the pressure, subglottic pressure, is going to begin to increase every step you move to the midline, every step that you close the door a little bit, you have more people waiting to get out. And when you just close, you know, the, the door just really just, uh, just enough for one person, then you have a lot of people waiting. When you shut the door, then the whole, no one is, is there and everyone is pushing, trying to get out of the door. So, by the time that the vocal folds uh, reach, uh, you know, touch each other, now the pressure reaches the maximum level and it will be stronger than the elastic, the elastic force. Now, we said before in, in other classes that the elastic force is going to, um, the elastic force, uh, is, is, you know, what, what brings something back to its original position, uh, is going to decrease as you go from the maximum point of displacement. As you go closer, closer to rest, the elastic force will decrease and decrease. When you go to rest, there is no resistance at all. There is zero elastic force. So, because that is where the vocal fold wants to be now. So, when the elastic force is so weak now, and air pressure is so at the maximum level, that is going to make the air pressure overpower the elastic force of the vocal folds and it will begin to push away or to displace the edges of the vocal folds away from the midline. And that they start to travel, the both edges, each vocal fold will start to be displaced like this, away. And as it, as it gradually goes away, air will increasingly stream out. So that means that pressure becomes relieved gradually uh, and gradually, gradually. Every step that you, that the vocal folds, you know, go far away or, or become bigger, open more, then more air is going to be released and thus the pressure will decrease. When, <clears throat> by the time the vocal folds are, um, uh, uh, swung to the to the maximum points of displacement again, the pre the elasticity will be at the highest level, and air pressure will be at the lowest level. 
and that will enable elasticity to overcome air pressure and then it will bring the vocal folds back again as it is bringing the vocal folds again gradually 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 the air pressure will increase and increase until the vocal folds meet each other and the pressure again reaches maximum it is a cycle and it keeps going on and on like a seesaw but there is something that you need to know now what if i mean could you imagine one point where the two forces are exactly equal so elastic the elasticity as it keeps going back to the midline it, it, it the, the, the the mucosal edges that the um, elasticity will decrease and at the same time as air pressure um and 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 air pressure is going to increase gradually there will be a point where both of them are almost the same the same level so how do you now but the vocal folds are close but they are not uh they are not um uh, uh, contacting they are not abducted fully enough to make speech so what what how do you break that tie and this is where the bernoulli effect comes in and it doesn't come in in the opening phase it doesn't come in here it comes in in the closing phase i can i can tell you that every sentence that i am saying every detail i am giving you is absolutely critical and you need to to mind every single every single detail that i am giving you so So I just want to make sure I am recording again. sometimes. Yeah. Okay. So you need to understand what I said. You need to know that this is what is creating, what is generating the cycle of phonation. The closing phase and the, the opening phase are produced as a result of the mutual resistance between subglottic pressure beneath the vocal folds and the elastic force of the vocal fold uh, mucosa, the vocal fold tissue. And in addition now, in addition, sorry, uh, the, in addition you have, you know, is, you, you have in the closing phase, then you have the Bernoulli effect coming in to aid the elastic force. And I'll explain this again more, but please make sure to master this process. Know how it works and know how to describe it in, in minute details. Every step, it leads to a different step. And once you get this, you really would have a very good handle on voice and phonation. So, this is from a, um, from a coronal, like view. So, yeah, if you have the, um, actually, it is more of a, uh, yeah, coronal view. So, you have one vocal fold here. There is an edge of the vocal fold. There's another vocal fold here. And then you have in between the glottis, the space between the vocal folds. So now, <clears throat> the arrow tells you the amount of pressure. So the vocal folds are coming close now in, in the closing phase. That means there is more pressure beneath them than above. And then they continue to come... Um, uh, actually, I'll start here. When the vocal folds are exactly touching each other and adducted the pressure reaches the highest level then um, once they start to just begin to to relax a little bit <clears throat> and the pressure starts to 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 push the the uh, through the edges uh, or the the mucosal edges of the vocal folds then it will begin to decrease. A little bit of air gets out, that means some of the pressure is relieved. 
and then the, the that will continue as <clears throat> as more air continues to stream out it will push the edges of the vocal folds farther and farther away from the midline once the vocal folds are farther at the farthest end of displacement then you could see that there is <clears throat> the air pressure reaches the lowest level and the pressure above the vocal folds is higher than below and then immediately um, after at this point the elastic force is going to overpower subglottic pressure and it will start to swing the vocal folds to the midline as they continue to swing down to the midline the pressure subglottic pressure continues to build up until the vocal folds are uh, coming together then the pressure reaches um, it becomes higher and higher and then you hold and sustain and then the next cycle begins because the pressure becomes more powerful than the elastic force the elastic force at this point is at zero so we need to describe this in terms of the opening phase how do the vocal folds open step by step and the closing phase when we speak about this we are speaking only about phonation adduction and adduction we are speaking only about this in every case here the arytenoids are fixated they don't go anywhere it is just the elastic force and the air pressure that will do all the work so now the vocal folds if you want to figure out how do they manage to be slammed against each other so repeatedly and they don't get damaged uh, if you can just do some simple calculation i'm going to tell you and you'll be surprised we said let's say a female adult female her vocal folds are going to make 225 vibrations per second how many vibrations per minute will that vocal fold make if that person speaks for one minute so you go and say 225 200 say 20 or 25 times 60 and you tell me how what the number is and then that number times 60 minutes and see what the number is going to be how how many times the vocal folds slam against each other for one hour in one hour of speaking what about the fact that you might be speaking four or five or even six hours a day how many times will that be so the idea is that the vocal folds are constantly slamming against each other but because the vibratory edges the mucosa um, is made out of that gelatinous rubbery stretchy malleable kind of structure um, it, it enables the vocal folds when they slam against each other to be like two pieces of jello hitting each other and each one just makes itself distorted and to absorb the other one hitting it and this video is a wonderful animation uh, it's, it's a wonderful imaging of slow motion of jello hitting you know other jello and how you can see the when the, the two pieces smash against each other each one is going to be distorted and it will then after the impact they bounce back to where they were and you keep doing this and that nothing is going to happen of course there are some people who can tolerate more speaking than others and there are individual differences but also there are problems that can happen if you overstretch if you overuse your vocal folds there's overuse there's misuse there's hyper functional use for example overuse is i am uh, you know for example if i'm teaching three classes a day and i speak for like say five hours a day if I take another class, um, might, that was going to make me speak more. That's going to put more strain on my voice. 
that I might have a hoarse voice. I might start to develop a voice problem. Uh, that is overuse. What if um, I go to a like a celebration or a party or something with the or maybe a sports game, and I'm yelling and shouting and you know making a lot of you know screaming. That is hyper functional use, and in some cases it can cause a cyst. It can cause it can cause trauma to the vocal folds and so on. And there's misuse. That is when people are not using their voices, the way the, the vocal folds the way that they should. Uh, by making like, you know, strange sounds, imitating animals, making strange sounds with their vocal folds that, that are, um, that, that could put a strain. So that is, uh, that is sometimes, that is called misuse. Uh, also the term vocal abuse can, ha can be, uh, used to describe someone who shouts and screams and just is very aggressive verbally all the time. Uh, that can cause a voice problem, and we, we sometimes describe that as vocal, ab vocal abuse. So watch the video and see how the compliability or the compliance of the vocal folds, the high elasticity that they have, that they just are malleable and stretchy and flexible. So when something is, they slam against each other, they act like two pieces of jello hitting each other. They do not harm each other. But they have to be hydrated all the time. The vocal folds, on top of the vocal folds, um, I think I described that. Thing. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, you don't see it here, but on top of the vocal folds, there is, um, there are what we call ventricular folds ventricular folds and these um you can see a little bit of the, here uh, in this area here. see these two like areas they are called the, the ventricular folds they uh, produce uh, mucus and the uh, fluid to lubricate the vocal folds all the time. And if the vocal folds dry out, that is a recipe for a voice disorder. All right, so this is the statement. Make sure to understand that the phonation cycle um, the, the, in the phonation cycle, the arachnoids do not play a role. They, they just play one step to uh, initially to do arachnoidal adduction and bring the vocal folds to the midline and they are fixated, they stay there, that's it. But the cycle itself is the byproduct of the mutual resistance between vocal fold elasticity and subglottic pressure. So now let's uh, again describe the opening phase again, but here you have the steps right there, and um, I'm. If I add anything else, just integrate it. Your notes. So, first, the opening phase. Now the vocal folds are adducted and into speech mode now. And now, at that point in time, you have to describe what happens to elasticity. Well, where is it, what elastic, I mean, the level of the elastic force, what is the level of subglottic pressure? You begin with that. And then as you keep speaking, you have to go back again to these two forces in the middle. How are they? Which one is more powerful? And as you go to the maximum point, which one is more powerful? Which one is weaker? And which one is gonna overcome? And as you keep, so, you have to describe uh, elasticity and um, elasticity and subglottic pressure every step from the, the beginning before they begin to 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 add duct and in the middle and at the end. So at the point when the vocal folds are fully adducted, um, the 
elastic force of the vocal folds is at zero because the the vocal folds now are in that position like a piece of elastic they want to be there that is the rest position and if you take them away they want to come back so if the elastic force is at zero at the mean in the meantime the uh, subglottic pressure is at the maximum limit limit now so subglottic pressure as a result is going to overcome the mucosal edges of the vocal folds and it will push both you know each vocal fold away from the midline and as as they gradually keep moving away from the midline i mean the, the mucosal edges subglottic pressure is going to decrease the elastic force will increase they are always opposite when the vocal folds reach the maximum point of displacement like this then at this point in time again i describe the elastic force as the maximum reaches the maximum level and the subglottic pressure reaches the lowest level at this point the elastic force will overcome subglottic pressure and will begin to swing the vocal folds to the midline as they come close the clo closer and closer and closer we'll speak about this now in in the in the next phase with the closing phase in detail because that brings us to the bernoulli effect so the bernoulli effect says now again don't make this mistake some some students make the mistake when i say what does the bernoulli effect say exactly or the bernoulli law they say, oh, it says if the vocal folds go this way, then no. The Bernoulli effect or the Bernoulli law has, when it was phrased, it has nothing to say about the vocal folds. The Bernoulli effect is just an effect that was discovered in, in nature. It applies to so many things. And we know now it applies also to the vocal folds. Air, airplanes fly, you know, they are kept, you know, in the air by the power of the Bernoulli effect, for example. So you can Google it and, and learn about it. But you need to know the words. When I say precisely, what does it say? You have to understand it first. You have to memorize it so that when you, you, every word you say absolutely is in its place. So it says, as velocity of airflow through a constriction increases, as the, the speed of air that is passing through a constriction, as the speed of air increases, air pressure at the constriction decreases. It's like you have a bottle and, you know, you pour water out of it. As the water continues to speed out, then the pressure at the constriction becomes lower. That pressure now becomes lower. It creates suction. You do notice this in your in your shower with the shower curtain. So <coughs> imagine you have a bath, you have a shower that has two shower curtains, one on the right, one on the left. You put the water on, the, the, the hot water. Hot water, we know that heat, hot air is going to rise. So the hot water is going to raise the temperature of the enclosure that you are in. So air pressure is going to, I mean, the hot air begins to rise. That means you have lower air pressure now in that enclosure. Now, when you create lower pressure, the air that is outside wants to jump in to come and fill in that space that that had less air as a result the screens at the uh, curtains are in the way of the air so the air pushes each screen you know toward you so this way the the screens are both touching you you can do this again get one balloon one balloon put them next to each other get a straw blow air in between the two balloons will hit each other <coughs> so 
This is what the Bernoulli effect says. You know exactly what it says. And now I'm going to explain to you exactly how it contributes to the phonation cycle. And remember, when it contributes, it does, it has nothing to do with the opening phase. It, it has nothing to do with the opening phase. It has everything to do with the closing phase. Because you, you want suction. You want the two curtains to come close, close the, the, the airway. And the, the, the two vocal folds act like this. So, the, the, the closing phase begins, of course, at the end of the opening phase. The vocal folds are far like this, displaced. At this point in time, again, we describe, say, the elastic force is at the maximum level. At the same time, the pressure, subglottic pressure, is at the lowest level. That, that causes the elastic force to, of the vocal folds to swing the medial edges back to the midline. As the vocal folds start to swing back to the midline, subglottic pressure continues to build up, build up, and the elastic force begins to decrease. They will come to a point where they are just about even. But the vocal folds are not yet, they are approximated, they are not yet fully abducted, we cannot speak. So this is where, at this point here, the constriction causes an increase in, in, this, in the flow of the air as it streams out, because you have narrowed this, it's like you have a hose, and if you want to, the water to shoot farther away to raise the pressure of the water, you, pull, you, you, you obstruct it with your thumb and the water is going to just shoot. You raise the pressure. So this is what happens here. The speed of the airflow increases here and as a result, it will create a point of negative pressure, negative air pressure at the constriction. And that will suck the vocal folds closed just like this. And now the Bernoulli effect has aided, has helped the elastic force to overcome subglottic pressure. And then you um, compress the vocal fold uh, edges are compressed again. And then when the pressure is strong again, uh, strong enough, it will repeat the cycle again. So this is very clearly detailed. I repeated as much as I possibly could. You really need to understand it. If you cannot describe it to yourself now without looking at your notes and so on, you need to understand it more, go back and describe it to yourself, maybe write it down or explain it to someone step by step, because if you leave one step out, the process is not there. <coughs> so now we'll speak about the um, uh, fundamental frequency, and uh, we speak about the, the kinds of pitch, um, now that we understand how the vocal folds close and uh, I mean, um, abduct and abduct. So the average fundamental frequency of vibration. Basically, uh, your vocal pitch, your fundamental frequency the, of the vocal folds, um, is determined by how big your vocal folds are, how massive, how tense, and so on. And your pitch in the morning is different than your pitch in the afternoon, than your pitch at night. <clears throat> so it, it changes because your muscles, you know, in the morning, they have rested for, you know, seven or eight hours during sleep. And now when you start to wake up, the, your voice is low pitch and kind of, because it, it's like any muscle, it needs to warm up. So the average vocal uh, for fundamental frequency is taken several times a day, and then you average. So, for example, in the morning, you might have a 200 hertz, uh, hertz you know, kind of pitch. 
it might even be lower. And then yeah, by nine o'clock, your voice just peaks and it reaches like the best uh, by nine. So maybe you have 225 then. But as you keep using your voice, <clears throat> the longer you use it, the lower they get fatigued, the lower the pitch is going to be. When you average, you, you take it like four or five times a day, add them up and then divide by five. If you do it five recording five times and measurement, then you will have 225. That's the average uh, fundamental vocal frequency for <clears throat> uh, adult females. So the, fun, the, the, the uh, vocal fold frequency, it is, we understand it, we hear it, we know it as pitch. So um, again, it, it is dependent on age. Children, they can have, a newborn can have a pitch of like over 1200 hertz. The, the pitch is so high. And then <clears throat> on average, um, children uh, up to maybe 10 or 9 years old, the average is about um, 270 to uh, 300 uh, hertz or something like that. Uh, just as, as a group, as a whole. Until age 9 or maybe 10 years of age, it will not be possible to distinguish the voice of a boy from the voice of a girl on the average the the basically the fundamental frequency is very similar but then this is once they start to dis differentiate into puberty then the the, the female <clears throat> is going to be a little bit changing a little bit in the lower end like maybe 270 maybe 300 but the the, the male is going to start to have a more massive larynx, the vocal folds become bigger and heavier, and then the larynx itself is going to descend in the throat. So, in the th so the vocal tract itself becomes big, and the vocal folds on the larynx become big, and that will create the uh, conditions. So, you can think of the uh, adult vocal fold for an average male. Uh, you can think about it as the diameter of a quarter and for an average adult female as the diameter of a, di uh, a nickel. And children could be like, you know, similar to a penny. I mean the length. So now, <clears throat> uh, the process of uh, uh, producing higher pitch and low pitch. You should have studied this in, in anatomy and physiology, but I'm going to uh, quickly uh, describe the steps uh, and you need to understand them to be able to describe that as well. Make sure something causes something, something causes something. You ask why throughout the, the, the so the description. When we produce low pitch, <coughs> here you have the arenoid cartilages. This is the vocal process, that little triangle piece, where the mus thyromuscularis of the vocal fold, I'm sorry, thyrovocalis of the vocal fold is, um, is inserted. And this white tissue here is, is called the uh, vocal ligament that is made up of the um, uh, middle and deep layers of the um, uh, lamina propria. They make the, this tough kind of uh, uh, ligament and the vocal fold is resting on it actually. It's giving support to it, but it, it is a big part of the vibration. So, this whole muscle here is called the vocal fold. The vocal fold, we describe it we say the name of it vocal fold because it gives us vocalization, okay? Now it has an anatomic name. So vocalization is the physiological name. The anatomic name is the thyro because it originates on the interior, anterior, interior surface of the thyroid. This is why we, call, we start with thyro 
and it inserts onto the arachnoid. So thyroarachnoid muscle. That is the anatomic name of the vocal fold. So the thyroarachnoid muscle consists of two strands of muscle, like two independent little muscles. One that is close to the glottis, that is called the thyrovocalis because it originates in the thyroid and it inserts onto the vocal process. Thyrovocal is vocalis. And the bigger, more massive part of the vocal fold that's away from, you know, on the opposite side, away from the glottis, that is more massive. It's called the thyromuscularis because it is attached to the muscular process of the uh, arachnoid. So then, how do we create a lower pitch? We need to know the conditions for creating lower pitch. These conditions first, in order to make something vibrate at a lower pitch. You have to increase the mass per, you know, square unit. You have to, to make the, the, the vocal folds bulkier and heavier and less, less tense. These three conditions, you have to start with them first in order to um, make the vocal folds by, you know, produce low pitch, you have to create these conditions. You have to increase their mass per, you know, centimeter or inch or whatever. And you have to decrease their tension and you have to decrease their um, length. These three. So, and the, so how do you do that? We said that these two muscles make up the vocal fold, but they're independent, but they are joined all laterally here. They are joined together. They are attached. So the muscle that makes the, that is the single muscle that is responsible for lowering pitch is the thyromuscularis. Okay. The medial fibers, the medial fibers of the thyromuscularis will contract. When they contract, they pull on to the arachnoid and they pull it a little bit slightly forward, each one. And that now shortens that thyromuscularis, makes it shorter and thicker bulkier that now we have lowered the pitch we have decreased the length of the vocal fold however when this happens the thyrovocalis itself because the single reason why it it is it behaves this way the single reason is that because it is attached laterally all along the side attached to the thyromuscularis as a result when the thyromuscularis contracts and shortens itself, becomes bulkier, the thyrovocalis is forced to be bulkier, floppier, and heavier. So the thyrovocalis does not contribute, doesn't, it doesn't contract, it doesn't do anything by itself. Just because the thyromuscularis contracts and shortens itself to decrease the distance between the between the arachnoids and the th anterior thyroid, then as a result, and because the the two muscles are attached in the thyrovocalis and the thyromuscles are attached in the middle, then that is the only reason that will make thyro the thyrovocalis bunched up and it will make it uh, less tense it will make it more bulky and it will produce lower pitch. So the process, again, you should understand it step by step and you should really be able to describe it to yourself without looking at your notes. If you haven't done, a, you, you, you see that you haven't been able to or you missed a step or step out of sequence, go back again and study it, write it down to yourself until you have it uh, completely in. Producing high pitch 
is a little bit more complicated and it involves two muscles, not one. Two muscles. So I'll describe it here. If you have, you can read all of this, but I'll describe it. Here. So you notice how in here, the vocal folds are here. This is the area here is called the, the thyroid notch. A notch is a triangular space like this. You just cut, cut, take it out. That becomes a notch. Okay. So we are, we are going to look from the anterior now surface of this and and now you can imagine the vocal folds now here so let's look here here is the anterior surface here's the thyroid notch be below the thyroid notch and on the interior anterior interior surface of the thyroid cartilage below the thyroid notch the vocal folds originate the, the, the root of them is there this is why you say thyroid and then arytenoid so that is our first thing. That means if you manage to, to bring the, the thyroid cartilage forward, then what do you bring with it? You have to bring the vocal folds like this. So if you bring the, 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 this structure forward, you are going to bring pull and that is going to make the vocal folds longer. So how do we do that? How do we make the vocal folds longer? All we need to do is to move the, the thyroid forward, but it, it, it gives us more than that. It actually goes forward and it goes down. And in this case, it gives even more with two movements. It gives us more length because if you have a triangle, you know, for example, the, the line that is the, the, this, and this and this. If you know this line here becomes longer simply because of the angle. So if you move, you, you, in other words, when you tip the larynx, the thyroid forward and down, it increases the length to the maximum. You can increase the vocal fold length by up to 20%. So this is see the difference here. So how do we so again, pay attention to the question. The conditions are that I, cre I asked, I told you about. And now, in order to create low, higher pitch, you need to have to in um, increase the length of the vocal folds, and you have to decrease their mass, make them lighter, and increase their tension. So once you elongate them, you have achieved the, the other two. You elongate. It means you make them tight, you know, let me tense. And at the same time, if you measure each, you know, fraction of an inch of the vocal fold, now it is lighter than before. So these are the conditions. How do we get there? How do we achieve these conditions? We go by <coughs> the first muscle that is responsible for this, does most of the work, is the Crico, crico, thyroid, crico, thyroid muscle. So the crico thyroid originates on the anterior lateral uh, surfaces of the cricoid cartilage, and they insert onto the inferior lateral margins of the thyroid cartilage. When this mu this muscle left and right it is paired when it contracts it shortens itself and it pulls in the direction of, of its root so that see the root they make it intentionally like this so that you know muscles always pull in the direction toward their root so when the muscle contracts it will pull the thyroid cartilage forward and down now because the vocal folds originate on the anterior interior surface of the thyroid cartilage below the thyroid notch as a result of that when the thyroid cartilage is pulled forward and down the vocal folds are stretched thin and elongated and they will vibrate at a higher pitch but 
another muscle now is going to come in to contribute. The thyrovocalis itself, as the, the thyroid is tipped forward and down to elongate, the thyrovocalis will resist is going to, to be stiff, stiffen itself to resist and that will add more tension and more uh, stiffness to the vocal fold, that part that vibrates and that will even increase the pitch more. So you need to understand them again, that, that process step by step. Again, that you should have had this in AMP. If you didn't, then you didn't really... Um, Anyways, so you have it now, and you should be able to, to describe it word by word and in, in, in detail. Okay, optimal pitch is the best pitch that uh, the vocal folds can produce based on their characteristics, based on their level of thickness or mass, uh, length, and, and the physical properties that they have the best pitch that they can produce without fatigue or without pain. Um, then we have the habitual pitch. Habitual pitch is the pitch that the person is used to. I might be used to speaking like this all the time, you know, like this, with a high pitch all the time. And I have seen people do that. But that doesn't mean that is a healthy way of speaking. So a habitual pitch is simply the pitch that someone is used to. It may or may not be their optimal pitch. If it is not their optimal pitch, then there is a problem that we can fix. And ideally, everyone's habitual pitch should match their optimal. Here is a case, we call it puberphonia, that is described later. It's a great video that will show you a young boy who is in middle school and he's having difficulty transition into the adult voice simply because um, there are some psychological things involved but um, he has his vocal folds are completely adult-like and developed yet he is still using his child voice like his baby voice like a 10 year old or 11 year old voice so and uh, you notice that the speech pathologist in one single session enables him to get that uh, voice that matches his uh, his book of old, um, uh, you know properties now you notice he's going to complain of pain you know, she says, you know, so what do you feel? It's a lot of pain. But, but remember, when you raise pitch, you have to really <laughs> activate a lot of muscles. So when you are speaking in higher pitch all the time, you are so stressed and you feel the pain here because you are all contracting and other muscles will sympathize and will contract as well. So notice that carefully and that will give you an idea of what a speech pathologist can do in just a half an hour. It makes this is really, really powerful. Maximum phonational frequency range. Maximum and the phonational frequency range. It is the point from the lowest pitch that someone can produce, the lowest pitch to the highest pitch that they can produce. And for men, it goes, the lowest pitch is 80 hertz, to almost to about 700 hertz. That is so high, but that is the range based on average for humans. Women can go to 135 hertz to 1000 hertz. So uh, the um, when someone has a voice disorder, vocal pathology, that refers to that in like abnormality affecting the vocal folds, or the ventricular folds about them. So, um, vocal pathology causes this range to be less. So, if someone has a restricted range, they will have difficulty expressing themselves as well. They have difficulty, like imagine you are going to sing and you, you cannot go lower than, say, maybe lower than 200, and you cannot go higher than 210. How can you sing when you have that little space to, to wiggle around? You wouldn't be able to. 
So people who are singers, the best is when they go, to, they are able to go from the lowest and they go to the highest and go up, 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 up and go. They become like a very flexible, like, you know, when the way that they use their voice. They have many, many ways to vary their voice. And that will, of course, help you express your emotions and feelings and so on, produce lots of effects. So that's the maximum phonation of frequency range. The vocal intensity, uh, I mean, vocal intensity is primarily determined by air pressure. How much subglottic pressure do you push through the glottis at a given moment in time? So it is determined by subglottic pressure. If someone has compromised muscular abilities, like uh, thoracic muscles are not active, they are, you know, hemiparesis or someone has dysarthria, weakness, muscle weakness, they would not be able to expand and have a lot of air, you know, to, to vocalize and to speak. And that will cause their voice to be less loud and they will um, have difficulty expressing themselves. Their speech will be monotone and it, it will lead to also a lot of, you know, problems. Uh, when we speak about vocal quality, that is a, th there is no standard to say, you know, describe exactly. I mean, we can describe vocal quality. Someone's voice is fuzzy. Someone's voice is warm. Someone's voice is harsh. Someone's voice is, uh, breathy. Uh, someone, so, uh, kind of, a, a lot of variations, but there are some things, some terms that we commonly use. Uh, even though a lot of these descriptions that describe quality are subjective. <clears throat> so, breathiness, it refers to, um, kind of, at least you can perceive it almost like as hoarseness. I mean, not exactly hoarseness. Uh, if you listen to, Someone who has spoken a lot, like when I speak and speak more, or you go and speak a lot more. I am not yelling or screaming, but I'm simply just overusing my voice. That will make it breathy. So it, it is, it, it, the breathiness usually uh, happens when this point, uh, exactly if you look at the vocal fold and divide it into three parts, here's one segment. And there's one segment and one segment. So we call this, this is the front, this is the anterior, this is the posterior. We call this the anterior one third of the vocal folds. And this is the medial. And this is the posterior. In here, that is reversed. You, you know because of the arenoids. So that is the anterior one third, medial one third, and so at exactly the um, at the border between the end of the anterior one third and the beginning of the medial one third, there is a point that is characterized by a high impact because of the vocal force slamming and that person is talking and talking and or shouting and so on. That the, that will create this situation when the person has vocal nodules. So, as a result of that, two points now are acting like they are creating a, an hourglass, where you have an area that you cannot close here, and the area you cannot close, and that is what produces the breathy voice. But the voice is okay, I mean, it's not like the worst thing, because, um, because the, the edges are even here. If you don't have the edges even, you are going to create multiple spaces where the air just escapes and it just makes that, gives you that harsh voice because a lot of noise is coming out and a lot of air is leaking and that creates noises and that makes the voice unpleasant. It make, we call it harsh. So you combine hoarseness, I'm sorry, you combine breathiness and harshness and you get a hoarse voice. The hoarse voice that is like in laryngitis, where the vocal fold becomes so swollen, so heavy, and it actually becomes inflated and, and 
kind of turned to the side. So lower edges that are not supposed to vibrate will emerge and they will be uneven and they go with the other edges and the vocal folds are not. They have so much, um, you know, many gaps and, and a lot of noise is coming out and there's also breathiness and the, the voice is so unpleasant. And it is low pitch because the vocal folds become so massive, they are filled with fluid. So the vocal fold fundamental frequency will get some values in terms of um, in terms of the the average ranges for particular age groups. We well, know the fundamental frequency refers to the number of vibrations that the vocal fold can make in one second. So from infants, 11, 11 months to 23 months, they have a vocal pitch of 30, uh, 350 to 500 hertz. As I mentioned, newborns have, they exceed 1200. So as you grow older, the pitch becomes lower because the structures become bigger. Ages three to 10 for males and females, it goes from 270 to 300 hertz. And it's very, very difficult if you are not looking, if two, if two people call on the phone at the same time, like say a brother and a sister, you wouldn't know who is, is who be, uh, from their phone uh, when they speak on the phone. But after that, they differentiate. So after puberty, females tend to kind of be around the 270. And then uh, the males, they're going to start to drop because of the reasons I explained earlier. Uh, go to the table in your textbook and you will find this, more of these values described. And just keep in mind that the research, there's a lot of research that gives kind of conflicting data. It is not exactly conflicting. It's depending on what sample of people and where did you test them. And then there are two videos here that I would uh, recommend that you that you watch. And so the, these are the values I just mentioned here. Yeah? Children before puberty, uh, actually, uh, this there's a, something wrong with this. I'm sorry. Uh, this 350 to 500. I forgot to uh, correct this. So, but the other values are um, are okay. So the, I guess, age-related changes, age-related changes. I'm afraid to, to, you know, stop to correct it and the video stops and it will be, it will waste all my, my work. So again, for males, as they transition to puberty, the vocal folds become more massive, they become bigger, the larynx itself becomes bigger, you can see it more prominent in their and their throat, the, the larynx itself descends more, the vocal tract becomes bigger and longer, and all of that is going to give them the low pitch. Um, the adult male, average adult males, as, as we grow older, uh, the problem with men is that their muscles atrophy, their muscles, they lose muscle bulk. Okay, and the, the, um, as a result, the vocal folds are muscles. So they will shrink, the, the, the mass of the vocal fold becomes less, like about 65 or 70. So you might have like a, a 10 hertz um, decrease, I mean increase in the, in the pitch or something like that. Uh, that could occur as a result. The adult females, <coughs> when they reach uh, menopause, and some fat tissue and, and extra, tissue will, will build up on the vocal folds and that will make them thicker and that will, is going to drop the pitch um, by again uh, maybe 10, maybe uh, 10 hertz or 5 hertz, something like that. Now there is something called frequency variability. Variability means going up and down, changing so frequency variability, um, it, it, again, if you compare genders, it, they, they have different um, pitches. Uh, if you look at frequency itself, it should be determined by the size and the 
features of the vocal folds itself. Uh, so vocal pitch again, because the vocal folds are so much uh, kind of integrated with our emotional system, the smallest changes will reflect, and also the vocal tract itself. It will reflect on, I mean, our mood will show through our voice because there's a huge connection between the vocal folds and the uh, vocal tract and um, our uh, emotional system. So pitch, as we speak, um, we raise pitch kind of 20 to 30 hertz, um, and you know, kind of more than, than the average. We can just go up and come down again, and that will produce that kind of dynamic, you know, speech that makes effects. And if you read a book, for example, and you, you, you act, you, your voice matches the, the characters' voices and so on, you can make a lot of effect. You will be so interested and so animated. So that produces um, a great effect and it will make our speech not monotonous. But again, if, if you have a restricted uh, frequency range, you would not be able to do this much. Your speech will be more monotone. If you do not have enough, uh, enough uh, pressure, subglottic pressure, you will not be able to do this because again, this requires more pressure. There's also intensity variability, the same. You, you make your voice louder and you make it go back again. So in conversation, uh, conversational speech is about 65 decibel uh, to 80 decibel uh, speech pressure level. Uh, so, but the average is 70 decibel. So that means that we have like a 10 decibel kind of, you know, variability. So you can go 75, raise your voice, you can go 65, you can go 80. So you have like about, you can raise and go down by 10 decibel. Um, and, and the combination of raising, changing your pitch and changing your loudness is what makes your speech more dynamic, more interesting, and it doesn't cause your listeners to fall asleep. So, um, if you do not do this, again, there are reasons that I explained. If you can't do this, that is going to affect the way that, uh, that basically will make you have a monotone and you will lose your listeners. So, in terms of the ability to vary, uh, I mean, as you speak, the uh, variability range, uh, uh, variability and in intensity, uh, children, infants, you know, they can make that change automatically because it, it, it prevents the nervous system of your listener from habituation, from getting used to uh, and tuning out your voice. So um, that intensity variability will, will slightly decrease, but with old age, because the with old age, there's less muscle bulk, there's muscles become weaker, and the person doesn't have enough, you know, pressure, and that will uh, will decrease. It's basically as a result of lack of enough um, enough subglottic pressure, and they can't even raise their voice as loud. So, um, if someone has a voice disorder, that is going to make it difficult for them to change, to, to raise and lower their, um, th their intensity easily. A dynamic range is the range of vocal amplitudes that a person can generate from the softest phonation to the highest or the loudest, I mean, phonation. So the softest phonation that is not a whisper, because whisper is not phonation. Then whisper, the vocal folds don't vibrate. So to the loudest shout that the person can make in decibel. So dynamic range, you know, for fem it is measured for females, uh, 50 decibel to 115 decibel. You know, females' voice can, can reach 115 de uh, decibel. The, the male, is 50 to slightly higher than 115 higher because remember 
the males have more, like say, more air inside of the lungs, and they can they can put more pressure as a result of that. That will make the voice louder. So if someone has a restricted dynamic range, say, if, you know, this from 50 to 115 takes a long time to get there, to get from here to here, you can make lots of effects if you are singing or if you are, you know, speaking and making a lot of effects smoothly going from one end to the other. But with a voice disorder uh, that affects the vocal fold uh, properties, that is going to make that range restricted and the person will not be as expressive and that will cause also a monotone. Um, it will make it hard for someone to to make uh, to stress certain syllables. Um, uh, it also will make it difficult for the person to express their emotions because um, the your, your emotions are produced in the way of raising your pitch and raising your uh, volume. If you if you cannot do one or the other, that is going to to decrease your ability to express your emotions. <coughs> and then perturbation rates. These are changes from cycle to cycle of vibration. If the changes involve frequency, we call this jitter. And if the changes involve loudness, we call that shimmer. So imagine that you have, say, a sound wave that is, I mean, a tone that is made of a hundred waves. So you have measurements, electronic measurement systems that are going to measure every single cycle. And so if you say periodic, it means, it should mean that every cycle is the same. But that is not the case in vocal folds. One cycle can be a little bit uh, uh, kind of uh, longer or shorter than the other. So it is the difference, if it is 1% difference or 0.2% difference, that is fine. Every one of us, like if you ask me to hold my hand like this, you might see it as, you know, steady, but if you measure, you have a good camera and you kind of look deeper, you will find my hand is, is, is like this. And the same thing for the vocal folds. They are not steady all the time. So as a result, all of us, you know, when we speak, there's a little bit of a difference between one cycle and the other. And that is in, in terms of wavelength, how big the cycle is. And that is called jitter. So again, the values, if it is between 0 0.2 um, uh, and, and, and 1%, that is normal. For shimmer, loudness, uh, that, say, you have 100 cycles. When I say, ah, so you measure if it's 100 cycles, each one you would expect, you know, to be the same loudness, but that is not the case. You, you deeply are going to find that each one is going to be slightly different than the other. So, uh, about uh, a difference of 0.5, you know, percent is, is acceptable. But when, when these perturbation risks becomes, become more than usual, they can actually, uh, detect signs of early, um, neurological disease because the vocal folds are muscles. And if they are not behaving normally like that, this, tiniest changes will be detected on the vocal folds. So this way you can actually diagnose Parkinson's disease with this kind of test uh, <clears throat> that will take 30 seconds or maybe, you know, one whole minute maybe for recording analyzed by a voice machine. You can detect Parkinson's disease maybe 10 years earlier than it would be detected by other measurements. Vocal registers, the, we say the range, males, females, and the range of human vocalizations, um, that we kind of, uh, you know, from the, the, the lowest to the highest. Let's say 
60 to 1568 hertz. That is from newborn to the so uh, as as a range. You you make this for example as a distance. If you divide that distance into segments, you call these segments registers. Like you know the the, the lower part, lower frequencies, middle frequencies, and then the higher frequencies. So we call the pulse register. Uh, pulse register is the range that's very low fundamental frequency. And it is usually described as vocal fry or glottal fry. It's like this. Uh, I, uh, you know what I'm saying. So, and some people use it at the end of their speech and it's just, uh, I mean, the, it's controversial if it will cause vocal voice disorder or not, but, um, that is the vocal fry. <clears throat> or pulse register and model is is what we use in uh, uh, you know conversational speech on average the range that we use in conversational speech and falsetto is the higher end frequency and you know sopranos they use falsetto and that's again the higher end of the spectrum of frequency <sighs> Now, when we, now all that we described had to do with the vocal folds, how they are made, how they work. There are qualities, voices described as hyponasal, hypernasal, cul de sac. The, these are qualities, vocal qualities. However, they do not have anything to do with the vocal folds. They are not signs of vocal pathology. Hyponasality occurs, hypo means less, lower, lower nasality, lower air, lower amounts of air going through the nasal cavity. When do you need to speak to your nose? You, only three sounds. So when you say mm, and mm, and mm, mm. So how do you do this? So when you say mm, this Velum has to be down. Mm and mm. Mm. The, the, the velum kind of comes in contact with the back dorsum of the tongue. They come together. They make the constriction here. The air goes out. So these three sounds, if you cannot have enough air going through the nasal cavity to make them, then that is called hyponasality, less nasality in the nasal sounds. Um, <clears throat> then, with every other sound in English, this velum has to rise to meet this. See, this is uh, uh, enlarged. Now, this is normal adenoids. So that velum has to rise and seal against the adenoids here, like this. When it does so. Um, it seals the, it separates the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. All your sounds then become oral. If the velum fails to go to close or the velum is functional, but there's a big gap here for some reason, that is going to mean that air is going to escape when it shall not. If you say, ah, oh, it's a, mm, if you say um, E, mm, so air escapes during the production of oral sounds. That is hypernasality. It, it can be tested easily. You can get a, a dental dental mirror. We we when you go to speech, speech pathology conferences, you can buy a whole bunch of them, in disposable ones. So you can put one under the nose. Say to the person, say E, say E. If you see mist on it then that means there's hypernasality. Or you can get a clear straw, put it uh, inside of the nair, inside of the nose, and say to the person, say a vowel, any vowel, a, e, u, uh, and if you see mist inside, that means there's hypernasality. You can do it for mm, 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 and if you don't, have, well, that will make it harder, but it's easier to detect mm, 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 because the person will speak like they have a cold. And a lot of the situations now, when there's enlarged adenoids, 
the, the person has enlargement. Now see how the airway is restricted. And then this, this is going to cause hyponasality. Um, hyponasality is, uh, is, um, detected if you, if you ask the person, you look at them, they, their mouth is open. They breathe loudly. And then when you ask and say, do you snore? Does the person snore? Almost always they will tell you that the person snores that's a big sign not in the adults as much as in the kids because adults <coughs> snore more because of the tongue becomes big and it just flops on the back and shuts down the airway but for kids and and young people it is the adenoid that is enlarged and it it will cause hyper hyponasality it will cause snoring and a lot of heart and, and lung problems. Okay, <clears throat> so there are many kinds of vocal disorders. We did not spend too much time in discussing them here and because you're going to have a, a whole class that's called voice uh, disorders. Um, but the many causes of vocal um, pathology that really affects the vocal folds directly uh, are vocal abuse, like I said, using your voice inappropriately. You can call this, if it is yelling and screaming, vocal hyperfunction. If you are mimic making, you know, sounds that are not supposed, you are not supposed to be like making noises with your mouth, making, uh, imitating animals and making things that will put a strain on your vocal folds, that will be vocal misuse. If you are just, you know, doing your job, but you are speaking longer and more hours, singing more, you know, that becomes vocal overuse. Uh, cysts and tumors can grow on the vocal folds, like someone can go to a match, uh, to a sports game, and would just shout so hard that it's gonna, you know, pop a blood vessel in the vocal fold, it will create a hemorrhage. Uh, or it can create a cyst and so on. Uh, tumors like cancer can grow. Um, so there are neurological disorders like strokes, degenerative disease, like um, Parkinson's disease. Uh, there is um, trauma, that can, physical injury. Emotional stress is a big cause. And also um, <clears throat> if um, someone, for example, uh doesn't uh change you know their pitch gradually you know frequently during speech that is going to affect um, the way that they express their emotions and so on but if they have a vocal uh, voice disorder that will restrict their pitch and that will restrict their loudness that then will make it harder for them to express themselves uh, their emotions and tones, and you can't be sarcastic, you can't be like uh, joking, uh, you might be taken seriously. Restricted, so also uh, the person will have restricted uh, pitch range and the restricted dynamic ranges in terms of loudness. Uh, there is a term called diplophonia, it means double phonia. Phonia means phonation. Uh, that is, it happens when one vocal fold becomes heavier than the other when you are beginning to have laryngitis and one vocal fold is infected and it's thicker and filled with fluid the other one is not yet and they so one of them is heavier so each one will vibrate at its own rate and as a result you have two voices you can try this if you get a balloon blow air into it and hold the neck of the balloon whereby one side is stretched more than the other and kind of make it vibrate and you will produce that effect. I do this in the classroom, but I don't have a balloon right now. <laughs> so lastly, prosody is also called intonation or the, you know, it, says it is basically the melody of language. As you speak, you have to go up and down, up and down. The, the reason I'm not <laughs> as dynamic now is that everyone is sleeping and I'm trying to, <laughs> you know, make, uh, raise my voice as much as I'm recording at two o'clock in the morning. So, um, uh, prosody is 
the uh, changes in pitch and loudness in continuous changes as we speak uh, you know this uh, 20 to 35 hertz that we, you know variability and also the variability in amplitude and in addition to that the stress that we use uh, as we stress particular syllables like you say um, for example uh, I say to you, I am sorry, I, I did, I, no one told me about the meeting. So, so what do you do? You look and say, I told you. I told you. So you, you say, I just put the stress into it and I told you. And then, or you can say, I told you. So the way that you emphasize and you stress particular syllables, that is going to produce particular effects, the whole range being sarcastic, being humorous, being angry, being sad, being excited, and so on. So that is what is reflected through the prosody or intonation. And, and again, you have any voice disorder, uh, or most, many of them can affect your ability to express, uh, your, um, your emotional prosody. Um, uh, sounds, uh, I mean, syllables that are high pitched, they require greater loudness. They require greater, um, uh, pressure, by the way. Okay. So that's it. Sorry. This one was a little bit longer, but it ends the phonation, um, uh, section. And, um, I hope that you listen to this again. And you pause it every 15 or 20 minutes, take notes, go back, check, and, and check the concepts. There are a lot of uh, big items, the processes that you need to know how to describe. And hopefully that will give you a good foundation for your vo voice class in grad school. Thank you, and I'll stop here.